So, this is the 18th lecture. Um, in this lecture, we're going to discuss one of two manifestations of the most important fact in probability, which is called the law of large numbers. And the law of large numbers is suppose I always assumed it has the word law because it's supposed to be enforced by physics and the law of large numbers is ultimately the basis for all scientific predictions, at least predictions that can be expressed numerically. And so the law of large numbers has two versions. There's the weak law of large numbers and the strong law of large numbers. So the strong law of large numbers implies the weak law, but it's somewhat more subtle to understand, and it's much harder to prove. So we'll be able to deduce the weak law of large numbers from Chebyshev's inequality, and so we will, in the course, have done a complete derivation of the weak law of large numbers from the axioms of probability. The reason the law of large numbers is the most important thing in probability and the basis of scientific prediction is because what it allows you to do is it allows you to connect the concept of a mathematical model with the concept of observed measurement. So there's a mathematical formalism called probability theory that is based on the axioms we started with at the beginning of the course. And then what we been able to do is we've been able to build a numerical construction of random variables and derive this parameter called expectation or mean which is determined by the mathematical model we have for our random event. And then what the weak law of large numbers tells you is that this mathematical parameter mu, which you've calculated, is relevant to your observations of in the real world experiment in so far as the average of your observations is going to converge to mu with overwhelming probability. So if we've been pushing the same formalism farther and farther, and we have this idea of a sequence of independent uh, 
identically distributed random variables with mean mu, which represent a mathematical model for a repeated experiment with no causal connection between the trials. And the probability of arbitrarily close adherence to the mean in the sample average goes to one with time. So you can see I've written out the mathematical representation of that. It, we have any positive error tolerance, epsilon. So epsilon is a very common variable in mathematical analysis for an error which you want to think of as being really small. So you have this positive number epsilon, which is some really small error that you're putting on the deviation, or th this is supposed to be the error in predicting that the sample average is the mean. So what the teal highlighted statement says is that no matter how small my error tolerance is, if I sample this enough, I will adhere to the mean according to that error tolerance, no matter how small it is. So the sample average will have a difference from the mean where the absolute value is less than or equal to the error tolerance. No matter how small you set the error tolerance, it's just if you fix the error tolerance and keep sampling again and again, the average will adhere to the mean up to that error tolerance with probability that approaches certainty. So you can see why this mathematical mechanism is the essence of scientific predictions because once you have a mathematical model for your experiment as a random variable, you can predict it with the mean and then you can say that if I sample this thing over and over and over again, the average will approach my prediction. And that's all you can ask for when predicting an uncertain event. The basic hypothesis of probability is you need to accept you can't predict a single coin flip. But what you can do is you can predict the average of a long sequence of coin flips. You know, more generally, you can, can't can necessarily predict every observation you make as a scientist or engineer, but what you can predict is once you have a mathematical model for your physical system, you can predict what you're actually going to observe if you test it over and over and over again. So, you know, there's virtually unlimited situations where the mathematical idea we call the weak law of large numbers underlies fundamental parts of science, engineering, and technology. It's like if you have a civil engineer who's 
designing a bridge, they're going to need to test all kinds of components. And what they need to do is they need to be able to predict how this component is supposed to perform in their abstract mathematical model of the bridge that they're trying to bring into reality. So if you're building a bridge, you have certain information about steel beams and, you know, you can look up all kinds of parameters about commercially available steel and you can calculate how much load a steel beam is supposed to um, carry according to your understanding of solid state physics. And once you've done that, you can incorporate your mathematical model of a steel beam into a larger mathematical model of a bridge that you use to um, get the overall plan. And then when you're actually building this, what you're going to do is you're going to implicitly rely on the weak law of large numbers to say that I have this mathematical model for my steel beam. And if I actually put this beam there in reality and force it to, or subject it to certain stresses over and over and over again, it's going to perform in the long term as my mathematical model expects. So, you know, if you think about a steel beam, it could be subjected to various kinds of stressors or shocks, and you would need to have a prediction for how much damage to the load-bearing capacity these shocks might create. And so if you say, okay, I'm going to design this based on the idea that I've calculated whatever shocks are going to happen will not collapse the overall mathematical architecture of the bridge. And then the weak law of large numbers is giving me um, a reasonable justification to believe that because this steel beam is going to work in my mathematical model where the expectation of catastrophic failure is really low, what's going to happen in reality is that when this gets tested over and over again by the natural stressors on a bridge, it's going to perform according to the way my mathematical model expects and therefore it's not going to collapse because I constructed it intentionally in the context of engineering design to not collapse. And because of the weak law of large numbers, I believe that my engineering design principles are going to be borne out by what actually happens in reality, and so the bridge won't collapse. It's the weak law of large numbers that makes the connection between scientific theory and observed 
reality. You expect certain things based on mathematical models, and you see that happen in the long-term observations of your experiment. And that's how the scientific method works. So, you know, it's a simple mathematical statement, but its consequences are gigantic. It says that once you have a mathematical model that gives you an expectation, there's a scientific inevitability to observing this particular number as the long-term average of what actually happens in the empirical experiment. Okay, so we can derive the weak law of large numbers from Chebyshev's inequality. So if we look at the statement of Chebyshev's inequality, it said that the probability that the empirical average minus the mean was less than or equal to c times the long-term standard deviation, supposed to be greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over c squared n squared. So um, let's adopt this notation sigma like we were doing before when talking about Chebyshev's inequality. So we were writing sigma n for the long-term standard deviation. And the essential reason the weak law of large numbers works is because if you have the hypothesis of independence and identical distribution, the standard deviation scales like the square root of the long-term standard deviation scales like the square root of the number of samples, whereas the overall size of the sum scales like a constant times the number of samples without the square root. And so what that does for the weak law of large numbers is since we know that sigma n is square root n sigma, we can choose the constant in Chebyshev's inequality to be epsilon divided by square root n sigma, where epsilon was our error tolerance for deviation from the mean in the long-term sample average. So we set the constant in Chebyshev's inequality to be epsilon divided by square root n sigma. And you can see what that comes out to be is 1 minus sigma squared over epsilon squared n. And so the most important thing we can see is that if the standard deviation is a finite number and the error tolerance is a positive number, then those two parameters are fixed. And as the number of trials n goes to infinity, the probability of adherence to the mean converges to 1. So we can 
see explicitly the rate of convergence to certainty in the weak law of large numbers. It's the variance divided by the error squared. So the probability of adherence to the mean converges to one, like the reciprocal of the number of samples with this scaling rate in front of it. So you have one minus the reciprocal of number of samples with a scaling rate that takes into account both the variance of your random variable and the error tolerance you're putting on deviation from the mean. So if you have a large variance that creates more randomness and makes the convergence to certainty slower. And if you have a small error tolerance that puts a more stringent condition on adherence to the mean and it makes the rate of convergence lower. So you can manipulate the rate of convergence with the variance and error tolerance, but you can never ever get rid of the fact that once the variance and the error tolerance are fixed, as the number of samples goes to infinity, the average converges to the mean with overwhelming probability. Okay, so we can have a look at this example. So let's say x is a random variable with mean 4. And so... <coughs> And so we have this sequence x1, x2, x3 of independent, identically distributed copies of x. And so what we're asked to show is that the probability of the sample average being greater than 5 vanishes with time. So it says that there's eventually the odds of the sample average being greater than 5 are as small as you want if you keep sampling this random variable over and over again the average will be less than 5 with 99% probability and then with 99.99% probability and then with as many 9s as you want to string on. You just keep sampling and your string of 9s gets longer. So the probability, the weak law of large numbers tells me that the probability of the sample average being too close to 4 to exceed 5 is like 99.99999%. And so the probability of actually being greater than 5 is like 0.000001% because in order to be greater than 5, I have to violate my condition of being super close to 4, which had the 99.999% probability. So let's see how we can make 
that line of reasoning more formal. So what we want to do is we want to set an error tolerance of one half in the... What we want to do is we want to set an error tolerance of one half in the weak law of large numbers. And one half is usually a pretty big error tolerance, but it works out quite well in this context because five is quite a long way from four. And so we can push down the probability of being greater than five by pushing up the probability of being less than four and a half. So the weak law of large numbers tells me that there's overwhelming probability the sample average is going to be within one half of four. And so what we can observe is that if the sample average is greater than five, then there's no way it can be within a half of four. It's like the condition that the sample average minus four is absolute value less than or equal to half certainly implies that the sample average minus four should be less than or equal to a half. And therefore the sample average has to be less than or equal to four and a half. So if we put an error tolerance of one half on adherence to the mean, we can see that that error tolerance excludes the sample average being greater than five. And so what that says in probability is that in order to be greater than five, you have to fall in the complement of one half adherence to the mean. So the probability of one half adherence to the mean failing is one minus the probability of one half adherence to the mean succeeding. So that's what I have on the left of the second last line. The, what's on the left of the second half line is the failure probability of one half adherence to the mean. And we can see that the failure probability of one half adherence to the mean has to be greater than or equal to the probability of the sample average being bigger than five. And therefore we can apply the weak law of large numbers to say that the failure probability of one half adherence to the mean is going to converge to zero. And so the probability of being greater than five also converges to zero. Okay, so we can have a look at this next example. So we can say, <clears throat> let x1, x2, x3 be a sequence of IID random variables. And we want to show that if there's a 0 0.01 probability that the long-term average remains at least two, 
then the probability of the long-term average being at least 1.9 approaches 1. So this is one of many remarkable phenomena that result from the weak law of large numbers. It says basically as soon as I have this microscopic probability, it bootstraps itself all the way to approximate certainty because the weak law of large numbers is a zero or one thing. It's your condition either satisfies the adherence to the mean, in which condition it approaches certainty, or it forces long-term deviation from the mean, in which case it approaches impossibility. And so we can see in this example that having this 1% probability of remaining at least 2 already jumps your probability of being at least 1, 9 to approximate certainty. So we can assume that the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability of the long-term sample average being greater than or equal to 2 is 0 0.01. So that's what the question tells us. It tells us that there's a 0 0.01 probability that the long-term sample average remains at least 2. And so what we want to claim is that because the long-term sample average has a positive probability of being at least 2, then the mean of these random variables has to be at least 2. So there's a uh, ubiquitous and fruitful dynamic of using sample averages to figure out probabilistic parameters and then using probabilistic parameters to make other predictions about average or about um, sample averages. And so what we can see in this case is that the expectation of the random variable has to be at least two because if it was less than two then adherence to the mean would crush the probability of being greater than two down to zero and we wouldn't get this one percent where it's bigger than two so let's try and make that reasoning more formal. So we need to set an error tolerance, which is whatever might hypothetically allow the mean to underestimate two. So we want to say, okay, if the mean is less than two, then we're going to get this error tolerance, which might be really, really small, but that's fine. It's positive because we're trying to investigate the consequences of the hypothesis that it's positive. So we want to show that the mean being less than 2 is inconsistent with a 1% probability of the sample average being at least 2. So let's see why those things are inconsistent. So we'll say the mean is less than 2 and then we get this error tolerance which is positive because mu is less than 2. And what we can see is that if the sample average is bigger than 2, that forces a deviation from mu, 
which is bigger than epsilon. So it you can work out in a calculation by hand if you want by writing the absolute value as two inequalities one on either side um, but it's hopefully intuitive that if we pick an error tolerance which is smaller than the difference to minus mu adherence to mu up to that error tolerance forces us to be less than two because our error tolerance is smaller than what you need to increase from mu to two. So we said, all right, what happens if mu is less than two? Well, as soon as our error tolerance is smaller than what you need to increase from mu to two, then what, um, actually, let me clarify something a little bit. This is excessively explicit. I should be a little bit softer. I will just write this. So this is, I, it's a fact that two minus mu over two is less than two minus mu, but the point is better communicated by what I have here, where I'm saying, all right, why is it I have this 1% probability that the sample average stays above two. Why does that force me to conclude the mean is bigger than two? Well, because if the mean was less than two, I could pick this error tolerance, which is two minus the mean. And then because my error tolerance is smaller than what I need to jump from mu to two, that means the sample average being bigger than two is a deviation that exceeds my error tolerance. And so that shows that the probability of being greater than or equal to two, which we assumed was 1%, is less than or equal to the complement probability of epsilon adherence to the mean. And the weak law of large numbers tells you that a complement probability of adherence to the mean is always going to get crushed down to zero. So if the mean was less than two, then the probability of being bigger than two would be crushed by a complement probability of adherence to the mean, and it could never sustain being as large as 1%. And so what we can conclude from that is that we get this miraculous bootstrapping effect, where as soon as we know there's a 1% probability of staying at bigger than two, we get a approximate certainty of being bigger than 1.9 or 1.99 or 1.999 or whatever you want. You can say, because I know my mean is bigger than two, I'm going to get approximate certainty for being bigger than anything strictly less than two because that is now an adherence condition, not a deviation condition. So what we've reasoned here is that because there's a 1% probability of the sample average being bigger than two, being bigger than two is an adherence to the mean condition rather than a deviation from the mean condition. And you have this complete black and white thinking by the weak law of large numbers, which says that any long-term condition about the average is going to fall into one of two binary categories. An adherence condition which approaches certainty or a deviation condition which approaches impossibility.
And since we know that being bigger than two has a 1% probability, we get the zero one effect of the weak law of large numbers where we know it has to have a probability of one in the long-term limit. Okay, so here's another example of how there's a fundamental interaction between probability and the scientific method. It's like we have in this context we're observing two parameters related to an experiment and we think that they should have a scalar dependence. So we have this IID sequence of random variables x1, x2, x3, and so on. And then we have another sequence of IID random variables, y1, y2, y3. And you can think that maybe these two random variables are something like... Um, current and voltage with uh, fixed resistance and we're trying to figure out what the resistance is because we know that the current is a scalar multiple of the voltage where the scalar is given by the resistance and so it could be that what this example is about in the real world is figuring out the resistance of a certain wire. So how are we going to do that? Well, you do what scientists do all the time, which is I say, I think that there should be a scalar relationship between these two things. So I'm going to sample the one thing a bunch of times and add it up. And then I'm going to sample the other thing a bunch of times and add it up. And then I'm going to take the ratio and I'm going to think this should come out to tell me what my scalar relationship is. And the mathematical justification for that is you can say, well, okay, if I say that I have a parameter mu x, which is the mean of current, and I have a parameter mu y, which is the mean of voltage. The weak law says that with high probability, the average of my current samples is going to be equal to mu, where mu is the well, the, I'm going to keep sampling what I observe for the current over and over again, and I'm going to call that mu x as the, what I think of as the average current that I was trying to apply during this calculation. So you might say in order to calculate the resistance here, I'm going to try to keep the current at one amp and the voltage at one volt. So mu x might be like one amp and what your weak law of large numbers is is that when I sample this over and over and over again, I should be getting roughly one amp for my um, sample average and I should be getting one volt for my voltage average. And when I take the ratio of those, well, when I take the ratio of those in the empirical averages, I should get the constant which represents the resistance of my wire. 
So you can say what's going on is I think there's a scalar dependence here and I'm going to observe it by running the weak law of large numbers backwards where I sample over and over again and then I look at the ratio of samples to figure out what the constant is in my dependence between random variables. So you're saying that whatever I'm seeing with these sample averages is overwhelmingly likely to be the actual mean and so when I take the ratio of sample averages it's overwhelmingly likely to be close to the scalar constant that relates these two random variables I'm observing. Okay, so we can see another very important empirical consequence of the weak law of large numbers. So what we can say is, let's say we have a sequence of IID random variables and we want to suppose that there's a probability, the positive probability, the sample average is growing linearly with time. And what we want to conclude from that is that the common expectation of these random variables is infinite. So if you reason that infinite expectation is unphysical, what this tells you is that if you are really observing an IID sequence, the sample average should never grow linearly with time. The sample average should never grow unbounded at all. And so if you have a sample average that's growing with time, then your hypothesis about independence and identical distribution must be fallacious or um, else you've accidentally discovered infinity in your backyard. So what we can say in terms of the weak law of large numbers is that let's think of a positive rate C. So C is the linear grade of growth, the linear rate of growth in the sample average that we're trying to investigate. And what we're saying is there's a positive probability that my sample average keeps growing like this linear rate. And so the weak law of large numbers says that if I have any finite number A and there's a positive probability that a is, the sample average stays above A, then that means that sample average above A has to be an adherence condition, not a deviation condition, and therefore A has to be less than or equal to the mean. Because if A was greater than the mean, then sample average greater than A would be a deviation condition and this probability would get crushed to zero. So in order for this probability to be positive, greater than A has to be an adherence condition, which means A has to be less than or equal to the mean because greater than the mean is the adherence condition and we're asking for a greater than condition on A. So um, 
because we know that a is less than or equal to the mean, whenever the sample average being greater than a has a positive probability, we can see that since the sample average is actually growing linearly, we must have that the mean is above anything we see in this linear rate of growth. So the mean is greater than c times 1 and c times 2 and c times 3 and c times any finite number. And because we're thinking of a positive linear rate of growth, c is positive, and this forces the expectation to be infinite. So you can see that the only way a sequence of IID random variables can grow linearly with time is to have an infinite expectation. And usually what you need to think if you observe linear growth in a sample average is that what I'm seeing here is either uh, changing parameters of the experiment or strong correlations between different trials. But one of the hypotheses about independence and identical distribution has to be false because the only way my sample average can be growing linearly is if the thing I was measuring was somehow infinite, which just doesn't really make sense in the real world. Okay, so can in the 